So PC Thomas. So today's uh, lecture is going to discuss um, or is titled using energy simulations to drive design decisions in the built environment. Essentially, the, the lecture is going to um, um, explore the use of modern suite of building uh, simulation tools applied to drive design decisions for residential renovation in Eastern Sydney. So if you're from Sydney, if you're logging in from Sydney, that's going to be great for you. If not, well, get a sneak peek of what's happening in Sydney. So just a little intro for PC. PC Thomas is a director at Team Catalyst and adjunct associate professor at the University of Sydney. He is a specialist in improving the energy efficiency and therefore reducing the greenhouse gas footprint of large buildings. PC specializes in integrated building design using simulation tools to assist in the design and delivery of sustainable buildings, in particular, in predicting the performance of the mechanical services. So PC, thank you very much for joining. Um, I know uh, Tuesdays 5 p.m. is not the best time for <laughs> holding a lecture, but this time we can get as many people from all over the world as we can. So we really appreciate your time um, for this. So today's um, um, lecture is going to span about 45 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes at the end for discussions. If anyone has any questions, please start shooting them in the Q&A, and we will address them at the end. So don't wait until the end. As soon as you get a question, shoot it in, and we'll uh, ask PC to kind of address those questions. So without further ado, PC over to you. Thanks Mohammed, Dave, Tim, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and I'd say maybe reserve your judgment on the cracking lecture till it's over. <laughs> anyway, um, I should say that uh, what I'm going to talk about today is actually not large buildings but uh, residential scale buildings because they're actually much harder to, to model them uh, bigger buildings. And uh, I thought I'd start off with a bit of rambling. You know, if you're invited to do a lecture, you're given permission to ramble. So I thought it's a good time to start. Um, and the way to sort of, uh, the reason I wanted to kind of talk about that is because all kinds of uh, analysis in buildings has a lot of mathematics attached to it, you know, and we forget sometimes how much math is going on behind the scenes. And then when we use models, you know, there's, uh, you can talk about lots of simple models, like they can do one thing very well, like heat flow or airflow or daylight or looking at building fabric or whatever. Uh, but when you start to look at, an, at the integrated performance of a building from many aspects, then you will start to find that the number of models start to reduce, right? You only get a handful of models which will do an integrated thermal performance type assessment in the world, right? So um, to give you, a, and these models, of course, change in time as information becomes available. And I thought I'd give you an example using the, how um, models have progressed in cooling load calculations for air conditioning, right? And one of the reasons is it actually is quite new, if you think about it. You know, the first models that became available were uh, 1927, a guy called Carrier came up with this way of making a building cool and essentially he did it to dehumidify printing presses, not even for comfort. But he didn't really have much maths, it was really observational stuff, you know, okay, the sun is coming in through here, um, heat is flowing from here to here, what shall I do, you know. And it, w it took 40 years for us to get models which actually started to account for the thermal response of mass in buildings. If you have a wall and there is a temperature on the inside and a temperature on the outside, there is a response. It stores some heat and it releases some heat. And it took the fast Fourier transforms to give us a whole series of updates. That was a big jump in that calculation process. But it took till the end of the 1990s to actually start looking at not only storage and 
in the release of heat from opaque materials, but to accurately account for data of solar radiation coming in through the windows, the transparent part of the building envelope. We used to use a fudge called solar temperature till that time. We still do sometimes, right? Anyway, so it's easy, you know, something to remember as we start to look at some of the stuff that we're going to do today. And because they're so complicated, I have this um, thing that I try to use models that are in the public domain, that are well tested, well documented, hundreds of PhDs input into them, the documentations available transparently, and a couple of them I use are on the screen. There's Energy Plus for thermal simulation, radiance for daylighting. Um, can I just confirm that you're sharing your screen? Um, hang on, let me go back and see. Sorry. I'm just finding my Zoom, hold on. Sorry. Right. Ah, here we are. I'd forgotten I'd stopped sharing. <laughs> All right, you'll see a blank screen right now. Uh, we I see think we just see yeah. your desktop. Yeah. Uh, now we see it. Yeah. Perfect. So I just go through, I've just talked to these slides and I, yeah, there you go. So I was saying that you know, that's why I choose to use public domain software because they're well documented and two of the models I use a lot are, are given there. Energy Plus for thermal simulation and radiance for daylighting and you can search them on the internet. You'll find um, you know, a lot about it. So why am I doing this ramble? Well, to kind of say that when you use a model, understand your domain knowledge first. You know, if you're using thermal performance, learn building physics, and then use your model to test your design. Don't let the model drive your design, right? And the other thing I think uh, most people who do models will agree with me is remember, as the Irish say, shite in equals shite out. If your model is not a, a reasonable representation of what you're trying to analyze, your results are pretty much worthless, okay? Having said that, let's get into the, the, <laughs> the lecture. Um, we're looking at Sydney, so here's a kind of uh, summary of weather data from a model called Climate Consultant, you'll find it. There's not much I wanted to say, except to say that, you know, in Australia, we have wicked climates, moderate climates. So we have a heating season and we have a cooling season and we have a middle season where if you do it right, you don't need much heating and cooling to be comfortable. So I'm gonna to talk to you about a renovation, a renovation we did on our house on a 1930s kind of cavity brick semi. You know, it's a building, um, double brick, very typical of Sydney's Eastern areas and located on a very, uh, you know, standard suburban street. And like most semis, long plot, right? And uh, basically this face is north, that faces south, so my garden faces south, if you wish. And here's a picture before we did the renovation. So if you, if you look carefully, you can see this thing was built, uh, was jerry built in the 1970s as an add-on from on the main house. And if you look carefully here, you can see there's mold beginning to appear there. So, you know, I got to the point where uh, we had to kind of um, decide to do it or else. Um, you know, buildings and renovations are not the easiest times in your life. But anyway, so step one is to do a design. And uh, we had a design in mind. Lena Thomas, who's professor at UTS, did the concept. And Peter uh, do the, did the drawings for the detail. 
Now I'll come back and we'll look at this again. There are a few elements that I want to talk to you about specifically, but let's keep moving for the present. So we built a thermal model, right? And I want to impress upon you that this is not a CAD model. It's a thermal model. So there's a fair number of things that it brings with it. It's a database with all kinds of things. And the way this model was built, there's, there's a neighbor's house next door. And then our semi is this one here with all the windows on it. And the semi that's attached to it is over there, right? Now, what I wanted to show you was that in this model, we're going to look at this renovated bit. And so a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you is going to be on that. And then if you look at the representation of that model over here, it's the living room on the ground floor. And I'd particularly like you to look at this last element here. So that's the wall that faces west and it has two windows on it, these two windows over here. And the bits that are in purple, they're really modeled as a shading device. They're not really modeled as a thermal performance uh, part of the building. Now these models were built almost five years ago. If I was rebuilding these models, they would be different. Uh, this would no longer be a whole model. It'll probably come out in pink because all I need is its shading impact on uh, my building. The one that's uh, the semi next to mine, I would have built that as an adiabatic model because I don't really want to know much about the heat transfer between them uh, since that part is kind of insulated from the other. Okay, having done, built this model, I want to use it to do some design decisions. I want to make some decisions based on that. So one of the first things we did was to kind of look at how does light play out in our design, okay? So if you look at this model, this is a, um, what we call a static analysis. It's done for an overcast sky. What are the daylighting levels inside the building, inside the rooms? Obviously you've got the old part of the house, 1930s, and you can see here fairly dark everywhere, except very near the windows. The new part that we are proposing has got much more daylight in it, okay? Now, how do I use this to take any sort of decisions? Well, we were extending the kitchen. And if you look at the kitchen, you can see that one half of the kitchen near the window has some daylight, but this part of the kitchen was fairly dark, you know? And that's something that there was the opportunity to um, put some interventions. So obviously that much was enough for me to take a decision. I mean, we could have done much more analysis, but at that point we said, right, what we need is a, a solar tube or a skylight, which brings in daylight um, in the kitchen. And that's what it looks like after it was built. Now, recently we went back and did a second model, something that wasn't available at the time when we did these analyses, to look at, well, what can we say about daylight across the year rather than at that one point in time for an overcast sky? So now you've got a way of looking at useful daylight and how you can utilize it. So what you can do is you can put a range so the range that I've used here is between 100 lux and 3000 lux. And it cycles through every hour where daylight is available. And then it works out the number of hours when daylight is within that range. So if I'm looking at that range, I'm going wherever it's dark, wherever it's blue, then there's less percentage of the time that that building is, that space has got useful daylight. And you can see here that, you know, near those big windows, 
you get about 50% of useful daylight. But between the windows, you're getting a lot of useful daylight. You know? And that sort of analysis starts to give you some ideas as well. And you can see that my kitchen decision, had I been able to do that, would still have given me some indication that there was too little daylight here. Now, compared to what was happening with the overcast sky, you can see here that while there's a lot of daylight close to the window, actually I've got a fair bit of usable daylight, even a little bit lower, uh, deeper into those rooms. So that's kind of um, a thing that we would do with daylight. Now, uh, the next couple of things are, I was interested in, you know, what's the performance in winter and summer? So the first thing I did was to kind of put a, a visualization of the sun uh, interaction with the model. This is on a winter morning, I think it's, yeah, it's 9.30 on the 21st of May that you can see here. And there was a particular reason that I was looking at these models. I mean, we can, uh, dynamically move the sun and get a movie and all that sort of stuff. But literally what I was interested in was in the morning, how much sun am I going to get through this east face, which is facing the neighbor. And that's the morning sun. You can see there's a patch of sunlight on the floor there, 9.30 on, on May the 21st. And there's a reason for doing that. And that's because after it was constructed, I took a picture at 9.30 on the 21st of May, and there's my sun patch. You know, it sort of gave us a lot of confidence about our models. You can see the patch there, and you can see what it looks like after. But the reason I did that analysis was actually trying to figure out how many hours of sunlight would I get on a winter day? And what it turns out is that I get a couple of hours in the afternoon of useful um, daylight. I get one to one and a half hours of useful daylight in the morning. But the rest of the time, the two roof ridges, our own roof ridge and the neighbor's roof ridge actually cut away the solar radiation. So I get some sunshine. I don't get a whole lot. Okay, and the models bore it out. So I took an afternoon picture. That uh, patch is a bit smaller than in the model because I've got a curtain across that window, but otherwise it's pretty accurate. Anyway, with that, what the decision is, you know, you're gonna have trouble in the winter. You, you don't really have too much solar gain coming in through uh, the windows. So the design decision obviously is to insulate. So insulation on the floor, insulation on the walls, insulation on the roof. Now we had to think about how we did that insulation. Okay, And here are some drawings that Peter made for us after we had some discussion about that. If you look at the roof um, insulation, you can see this aluminium foil over there, okay? And then you can see this beam and you can see there's a bit of a gap before the next layer of insulation in between the beams. And there was a reason for doing that. And that is because if you have aluminum foil, it's a non-permeable, non-vapor permeable membrane. And it's possible that you could get condensation on that membrane when the temperature differentials are Hi, like in a winter night, if you're warming up the room from the inside and the roof is facing a cold outside, it's possible to have condensation. So I devised an air gap between the two layers and actually it's open on both sides. So there's a little stream of air going past and I'm hoping that the condensation won't fall onto the insulation. We'll see in five years time, but that was the building physics which allowed us to do that, wouldn't be the model to do that. So similarly, if you looked at the wall insulation, this one's got a number of layers, weather techs, an air gap, insulation, plasterboard, framing. Now in the model, you can then represent that. 
So here's the, the representation of the construction in the model. Four layers, weatherboard, air gap, insulation, uh, plastering, oh, um, uh, 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 gypsum plaster on the inside. The thing to kind of think, is, uh, to look at is that here I've ticked this box here saying that the insulation layer has been bridged by hardwood. So actually that insulation performance is going to be derated by the, uh, the timber framing, right? Anyway, each of those materials, like for example, weatherboard, you know, comes with all the conductivity, specific density, all the thermal performance uh, values, all the solar and visible values, all the values that you would use for daylighting calculations, Emb embodied carbon values and other values as well. There's green roofs, phase change materials. You can put all of that stuff in there. So, you know, again, it's not a CAD model. It's a, it's a very a physics-based model. And then, of course, we can calculate what is the thermal resistance and the thermal transmittance for these uh, constructions. You can see here that uh, this construction has got an R value of about 2.2, but when you derate it because of the bridging, it comes down to about 1.7. So that's the number you want to use in your simulation to try and get the practical outcomes coming from there. Uh, and again, just to double check, that's weatherboard, air gap, insulation, and plasterboard there. Okay, so I've got my model represented. I make an energy simulation run. I run it for the month of Ju July in winter. And I do what's called a free running run. So there's no heating, no cooling, all the windows are closed, it's winter. And what do I get out of that? Okay, so the green line is the outside temperature in Eastern Sydney. And you can see we never really get to zero. This one is about two degrees centigrade. Even that's a fairly rare occurrence. This is, you know, a representative coldest month in, in July. I've got two days which are sort of below five degrees or two nights when it's below five degrees. And the takeaway message for me from this analysis is two things. One, the red line and the blue line are not too far apart. And that's the air temperature and the radiant temperature. So what the thermometer measures is air temperature. What I feel is radiant temperature. And what it's telling me is that they are not too far apart. So my design is reasonably robust. If there was a big difference between the two, then I'd start to worry, okay? And what's even more interesting is that the radiant temperature, what I feel, when it's the coldest part of the night is actually a little bit warmer than the air temperature, which is a good design, right? The second takeaway is that when it's really quite cold, two o'clock at night, my room, that space is traveling around 12 degrees centigrade. So there's a 10 degree uplift by the fabric, which I'm able to capture. So what I'll do is next, I'll take that information, stick it into an Excel sheet because I've got some criteria that I want to test, okay? I'm suggesting to myself that I feel comfortable if the space temperature was somewhere between 19 and 26. It's a daytime zone, so I only wanna use it between eight o'clock and 10 o'clock, and I'm interested in the performance at that time, okay? So from those hourly numbers, I'm saying, okay, there's 434 hours, um, that I'm going, I'm interested in. And I can see that there are about half of that time is comfortable without me doing heating and cooling, but half of the time is uncomfortable. So I need a small heating system to offset that load. Now I must tell you, I mean, we had, you know, visions of, um, you know, lifting the roof, opening up the north side, getting the sun in, all of that went away as soon as we started to see the budgets for construction. You know, we're, um professionals were not super rich so it was like okay how can we take a box and make it look good and just get what we need to be comfortable and i'm sure there's a lot of people um you know 
doing some something fairly similar on that. Anyway, that was winter. Now summer is different. You know, I started to look at the summer and we know these things. I mean, the building physics tells you all these things. All of a sudden the sun is high in the sky. Where the roof ridges were a problem in winter, they're no longer a problem, right? And in the afternoon, when you don't want the sun, you start to get big patches of sunshine come through those western windows. Remember I showed you those western windows in the beginning. Okay, so I do something fairly similar. I run, make a model, uh, make the model run for a summer month and I look at the week, um, a summer design week and try to compare the runs when I've got two options. Okay, so I want you to look at the bottom graph here. The green line is the outside temperature in Sydney's east. And you can see here, you know, Sydney, we really very rarely get about 30 degrees. Here's a day at about 34 degrees. Otherwise, we've got days at around 28, 29. There's another one there about 31 degrees centigrade. That's the green line. But if you look at the top graph and you look at this red line, that's the solar radiation coming through those western windows. And you can see that every one of these days after 12 noon, after the sun swings over to the west, you suddenly see this huge injection of solar radiation energy, solar energy brought in by the sun. And the response to that injection of solar radiation turns up as the mean radiant temperature in the space increasing suddenly. Okay, so what I feel in the space, my space starts to cook because sun comes in through the windows, you know, that heat, short wave radiation comes in, hits something, becomes long wave radiation or infrared radiation. And that's not opaque to the glass. It travels out much more slowly. So I start to store heat, right? And that's why it's predicting that even on mild days, I might really get some really warm um, temperatures in the room. So your obvious design response will be, well, my obvious design response will be, I got to cut out that sun, solar radiation. So in response, I schedule a blind. Okay, and I say, okay, I'm going to put a blind in. And that blind is going to cut out the solar radiation from six o'clock in the morning to 10 p.m. I just want to see what will happen if I do that. And the blue line on the top is what I've done there. Put, this, uh, put an external blind, which will cut off the radiation during that time. And when I look at the mean radiation temperature, you can immediately see what it does. I've got an eight degree drop in the mean radiant temperature because of being able to cut out the solar radiation from those western windows, okay? And you can see that happen all through the week. So th there you are, I've got a design decision to say that, well, if I can, you know, maintain the radiant temperature to be around the 30 degree mark for most of that worst week in my house, I probably don't need an air conditioner because from, for me, I can handle heat. I can't handle the cold, but I can handle the heat. So that was my design, design decision. And we went out and bought motorized Venetian blinds. Okay, I apologize for the picture. I, I went to my neighbor's house when it was on sale and I got it off the, the balcony there. But um, I can lift it and I chose Venetians because I can control daylight and because I can control natural ventilation. Okay, now how do I look at natural ventilation? You remember I showed you that picture and I said, I'll come back to you. So here it is. So when we did the initial design, our garden faces south. And in Sydney, if you've got a garden and you've got a, a space, you want a big door, a glass door, which can help you to look out in the garden. That's fairly typical for us. So we have one here, south facing, unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you look at it. But I've got now the east elevation where it's going to overlook the neighbors. Now, I don't want to see him. He doesn't want to see me. So we put some daylight windows on the top. 
but we also make one third of those windows louvers, which I manually operate. Okay. And then on the west elevation, in Australia, we have this beautiful thing called double hung windows, which you won't find anywhere in Europe because they leak. Okay. But they're great because they don't swing in or out. And when you've got a tight sight, they're very good. And you can open them. When you open the bottom, you open the top, you get um, passages from which you can encourage natural ventilation. Okay, so the idea was that in summer, you could open these windows, open those louvers, and maybe open um, the south facing uh, sliding door and give yourself um, a natural ventilation flow. So I tested that, okay? And here I have two hours for which I have visualized that, and you can see how it works, okay? Now, to build that into the model, you need to put in a lot of information, okay? Which windows are openable? When can they be open? What is the criteria by which you're going to open them, you know? If you've got an automated system which will allow you to look at the outside temperature and the inside temperature and take a temperature differential and then open the windows, go for it by all means. If you don't, well, then you've got to think about how are you going to use this house in practical operation? And for me, it was like, okay, on summer days, uh, I'm just going to do a whole month and see how it allows me to work. And those temperatures that I calculated, which I showed you, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, include these operable windows. And they are open. I think I've closed it in the heat of the day between, uh, I believe, 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. I've closed the windows, but the rest of the 24 hours, the windows are open. I'm just trying to test how these um, this might provide an output. Now, in this. Uh, in this particular picture, it is actually a little bit interesting and I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on that. And that's because you see, you can see that the airflow is coming in from these higher windows and leaving through the lower windows and from the open sliding door. Okay. Now that's not how you normally show natural ventilation happening. Normally, if you draw an arrow, you would draw the arrow from the lower window to the upper window because you are thinking that all the natural ventilation takes place due to buoyancy flows. But if you go and take the subject that Professor Lena Thomas teaches you in sustainability at UTS, you, uh, she'll tell you that those are arrows of hope, okay? The, the second sentence behind that is that wind winds whenever there is even the slightest breeze it overpowers the buoyancy flows and that's then driven the natural ventilation then becomes driven by the wind so this is a real perfect example of that depending on the wind direction here's another one you may get flow in that way in this case the wind direction is such that the bulk of the flow is coming in from the big sliding door and exiting from the top and the bottom. Okay, and you can see the times here. You can check that out. You can, this is um, not a CFD, this is just a visualization of what we call the airflow network. The, the models that we are using have got a heat balance uh, component and an air balance component or a mass balance component. And when they both interact together, you can get fairly interesting outcomes. Now, having done the simulation, I'm going to, you know, I'm interested in how does it work. So here we go. I did um, through the, did the same thing that we did for, for winter. I'm looking at um, how does it work for summer? And I'm saying, okay, I can sort of bear up to 28. If it starts to get beyond 28, then things are going to become pretty uncomfortable for me. So how many hours does it sort of get beyond that number? I think I've done this for January. Yep, there you are. So if I'm looking at just the air temperature, 6% of the time, that's not too bad. I can handle that. Okay. 
But if I start looking at the radiant temperature, then story, the story changes a little bit. About 40, 45% of the time, it's you know, pushing into the uncomfortable area. Now, the, real, the reality is gonna be somewhere in between. You know, because why? Well, I'm using one particular simulation year. Where the data, it's not going to be the same. Uh, the way I use the building is not going to be exactly the same every day. It's going to be different. Some days are going to be worse. Some days are going to be bad. I have seen that if there are three or four days, hot days in a row, then it can get quite uncomfortable. But that's fairly uncommon in Sydney. So at this point, the decision has been, we don't put an air conditioner, we have a small heater, that's sufficient for us. And the reality from observation has been exactly that. You know, we've got a digital thermometer in the room. We rarely drop below 16, 15 degrees on a really cold night without any heating and cooling. We rarely get, we rarely get up to 28, 29 degrees. Last year, about three times we got up there. Uh, and that was a 36 degree day. And actually there were three days running about 32 degrees when it sort of did that. Um, the back of the house is cavity brick. That's about five, seven degrees cooler. So you just migrate. I don't know how long that'll happen. With climate change coming along, we may have to change our decision, but for the present, that'll do, right? Okay, so um, just to sort of finish off on this case study, that's what it used to look like, and that's what it looks like now. And there's my air conditioner. There's a ceiling fan there. And then of course my um, natural ventilation strategy is the west facing and the east facing windows and this um, sliding door. Okay, so we're gonna leave that there for the present. Uh, when I was building this uh, presentation, I suddenly realized that I hadn't talked about energy at all. You know, I'm talking about all kinds of things to do with modeling, uh, but I've been talking about daylight and sunlight and natural ventilation. So I thought I should show you a little bit about how we do energy simulation for, or how we've used energy simulation for um, uh, looking at um, energy use in the building. So here's a, um, you might say a typical suburban home, two floors, um, three or four bedrooms in, I won't even tell you what suburb it is in, but anyway, it, we, had modeled this for a client and typically we do large buildings, large air conditioning system, control systems, select all kinds of fancy glass, shading devices, all that, and then look at control strategies, et cetera. This is new for us because one of our uh, colleagues is very passionate about passive housing, housing design. And so we've been doing a series of, of um, uh, consulting projects on that. So on this house, we put in all the right bits and pieces. You know, so we've got uh, insulation on the ceiling. There is insulation on the walls. We've selected fairly decent windows, uh, two types of windows. So the windows on the, the ground floor, have got a different performance to the windows on the top floor. Um, the, the client hired an architect. They brought the design to us. We optimized it or we changed it to kind of resolve things to it. And what we did was um, initially we started off by saying, okay, let's model what happens when we predict heating energy use across the year. So here's the annual energy simulation run okay, for a building like that. And what we did do is that we looked at um, data on how a typical Australian house leaks in terms of air infiltration. Um, and if you don't understand that term, there is a, uh, there's a one hour lecture I've done called energy simulation, introduction to energy simulation. It's on the design builder software website. You'll find it, you can have a look at that. And one of the loads in the building that, you know, adds to the heating load is how much a building leaks. Now, I was telling you my colleagues quite passionate about passive hours. And one of the things that passive hours does is it's a European standard. So they're very keen on reducing heating energy use. And 
there is an impact to air infiltration that you know in Australia we don't really think about a lot. So we did a number of runs, and I'm just showing you, you know, the final outputs. We did runs at 15, 10, 5, 3, etc. And we sort of said, okay, if you can get the house to three air changes from this 15 air changes by employing strategies to tighten up the building, right? Where do we go from there? And so you can see here, we used we predicted that you were using about 20 kilowatts of heating at the typical 15 air changes per hour leakage. By the time we got it down to about three air changes per hour, now you've got to do things to the design to make it tight. Okay, you've got to look at all your joints, you've got to put in a, a, a wrap, a barrier, a vapor permeable barrier, um, you got to look around the windows, how do you install it so that they don't leak, uh, all the joinery, all the gaps, all the switches, you might need to put, you know, we, you don't think that switches will leak, but on a cold day, if you put your hand near the switch, you'll find that it leaks like crazy. Um, any of the joinery that, um, say for example, in your kitchen, you'll have holes for the drains to go out from it. They have not been um, blocked off, you get a lot of infiltration coming from that. Okay, you do some of those things and you've gone from 20, you've brought it down to about 13 kilowatts. Okay, that's step number one. Step number two is you go, well, once you've tightened the house, there are some unexpected consequences. Okay, you have moisture in the house. In a leaky house, the moisture disappears because it leaks. But in a tight house, the moisture stays there and you might start to build up mold. Okay. In a leaky house, you don't worry about carbon dioxide uh, concentrations. In a tight house, particularly in a bedroom at night when you close the door and go to sleep, the CO2 concentrations inside that room will start to increase. So from Europe, and the US, uh, we've had what are called heat recovery ventilators, okay? So what you've got is you've got a little heat exchange box. You supply fresh air, outside air, to the bedrooms, to the living rooms. You extract polluted air with moisture uh, from the bathrooms, the toilets, the kitchens, and then the magic box exchanges the heat. So the, in winter time, the cold air that you bring from the inside goes past the heat exchanger, picks up the heat from the air that you're exhausting, right? When you do that, by just using the heat recovery, you bring it down from a peak of 13 kilowatts down to nine kilowatts, okay? So all this is from the models. You can test these sorts of things on your models. So if you then, took a summary of what we did. What we are saying is that for heating energy use, right? In Sydney, by the way, we got rid of about three fourths of the heating requirement by doing what we just did. You, the size of the equipment that you need, and by the way, there's a difference between thermal energy and what you need as electricity to give you that thermal output, okay? Uh, that's when air conditioning sort of comes into the picture. But anyway, you've gone from your requirement of 20 kilowatts of heating down to about nine. So the capacity of your system in terms of electrical energy has gone from about seven to three, more than a 50% reduction. Now that's not, that's for heating only. Okay, you've got to look at cooling as well. And again, there are where you have to combine what you can do with natural ventilation and what you can't do with natural ventilation. The problem with cooling is of course that you need the cooling on the worst day. Okay, so even if you did all the strategies for natural ventilation, et cetera, if you put the system in, the system's got to handle the worst day. Now, one of the things that we've been trying to tell clients, very difficult to 
get them to understand that is that you can actually undersize your system slightly so that on the hottest day when it is 36 degrees outside, you don't need to be 24 degrees exactly on the inside. You could be 26 or 27 and that'll still work, okay? And that kind of thing you can test on a model. You can deliberately undersize the system and see what does it, uh, what is the conditions within the spaces? Um, those are, you know, those, so I'd be saying that, you know, you can use these, the, these sorts of models in very sophisticated ways, as long as you know the question that you want to answer. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. I think we've just about crossed our 45 minutes and um, take any questions that we might have. Super. Thanks so much, PC. That's fantastic. Um, before we kick off the discussion, maybe I'll just start off with a question. So if anyone has any questions from the audience, please feel free to post them in. We did have a couple come in while you're presenting. So um, you probably can read them, but I'll read them out loud for the audience as well. So um, with regards to the analysis of the useful daylight, to what extent do the surrounding, does, the, does the surrounding context and specifically the trees affect the simulation? Okay. So again, I think it's about the question that I wanted to answer. You've noticed that in the model, I did have the neighboring buildings in there. So the effect of the neighboring buildings is included. Now they weren't uh, sufficiently, there weren't too many trees in my backyard that would really affect the amount of daylight that I was getting. So I wasn't really that interested in putting in the effort to the, make the model um, or include those trees in the model. However, if you wanted to, you could, you could put that into the model and it would allow you, it would give you the, um, uh, the effect of the trees. Um, my design decision didn't really require me to add the surrounding trees in there. But that's a good question. Superb. And um, another question is, um, how crucial is the weather data for the simulation? Uh, so if we had uh, the weather data um, for, uh, if we didn't have the weather data for a specific spot, or for the specific site of your building or project, do you have any recommendations about choosing the weather data for the simulation? So I'm guessing if, if you don't have the weather data available for that specific site location, what is the next best thing? Okay, again, that's a, it's a great question. Now, you gotta remember that your simulation works best when you are testing design A against design B, right? Your simulation, Simulations are not reality. They're a, a facsimile of reality. So by doing a simulation and saying that, oh, it's going to get within X percent of that, it's not going to happen, right? So when you do, uh, if you look at the weather data that's available, you'll find that there'll be one file for all of Eastern Sydney. There's one file for Western Sydney, and that's about as much as you will get, right? So again, you're getting a reference weather file and the way that people build reference weather files is they look at about 10 years worth of data. And then in some ways, in some weather files, they'll pick the most representative months for each of the months from those 10 years and build a kind of a, a mixed weather file, which represents that climate. But essentially what you're trying to do is to say that overall, how would the weather how would your design respond to that weather file? Okay. Now, if you've been following LinkedIn, um, you'll, you'll notice that Cyro has just put out, I think it was two days ago, a bunch of curated future weather files. Fantastic. Okay. Allows me to then look at my model, test it for what it is doing today with a file for today, run it through a 2030 file to say, well, what would happen if, I, if the weather sort of changed in the way that it's predicted. So these are tests that you're doing. I would say as long as we understand the question we're trying to answer, use it that way. But don't think that what you're doing is going to be exactly represented in the reality. It's not going to happen, right? Um, and then one more question that just came in. Um, of course, firstly, incredible data analysis approach to the residential design. How do you strategize if a skylight is to be included in a space? 
and how would it impact the thermal and daylight factors of the house? Okay, good question again. Thank you for that. Uh, now, as I said, if I was keen to understand that, I would have built a model including the daylight, the, the skylight in there, and then redone the simulation to see what the impact was that, okay? Now, at the time, and I'm, even, I'm not even sure that at the present in my model, I can do what's called a tubular skylight, which is what I, um, which is what I installed. The tubular skylight actually is pretty good in a thermal sense. It's got uh, a glass dome on the top and it's got a diffusing panel on the bottom and a very highly reflective tube all the, all the way through. In terms of the, if you look at the area of the, the roof and then you look at the daylight, uh, the, the tube area, it's a very small fraction. So, you know, in practice, that's not going to be um, a deal breaker, okay? But if I had many of them and then I wanted to account for them, certainly I would be putting those back in there, putting an infiltration rate for them, uh, an air leakage rate for them, putting a U value for each of the materials in there and then working out what the, the, the heat loss and the daylight change would be. But as a design decision for what I wanted to do, you know, I'm taking the picture to the client and going, look, you got a dark spot there. If you want to not have that dark spot and want to avoid switching on a light the whole time you're in the kitchen, that's a place where I should be putting in a skylight. Okay. That's what you want to do. Right. Um, and then uh, another one. So uh, how much consideration should be put into building materials? Can a well-executed sustainable design offset poor thermal materiality choices? Whoa. <laughs> These are some really um, hardcore questions here. And they're Tough fantastic, questions. actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, it's 6 p.m., uh, PC. You know, who would have thought you'd be answering I, philosophical questions at this time? I think I yeah, need yeah. my glass of red to start <laughs> answering these questions here. <laughs> no, but I think that's a really good one because I think yeah. that's, that's, a, that's a thing that we usually kind of hope that the optimization process is going to solve for us, but uh, the slightest change in the material surely has an impact. Oh, that's a, you know, the thing is that if you look, if you have a look, I mean, and again, uh, I would say, let me go back to Passive House. You know, they have five design principles that they talk about. And, you know, I need to sort of maybe moderate that to say that those five principles are extremely good for heating climates. For cooling climates, you probably want to do a little bit more than just that. But one of the things to think about is that once you insulate a wall, so if you go from an insulated wall, from an uninsulated wall to an insulated wall, even if you just put a small amount of insulation, you get a huge benefit. But then if you start increasing the amount of insulation, you get a marginal benefit, right? So somewhere you want to kind of say, well, how much should I put? And that then becomes, uh, you know, a kind of a conversation between what does the code want me to do, right? What can I fit into the construction without having to change my construction detail? Like we build, you know, uh, 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 framed houses, timber framed houses. You've got, a, you've got a reasonable space in that frame. So how much can you fit in that? If you, if you, Put in more than that, you're going to compress that insulation and you're going to lose the insulation value anyway. If you use the entire gap for the insulation, then you don't have a breathing space. You want a vapor barrier. Uh, you might, in, in the case of our wall, we had a, there, there's a weather barrier, which is actually a waterproof barrier, but it's vapor permeable, right? And then you want an air gap behind that. Then you want the insulation. Then you want the plasterboard behind that. So it becomes that, you know. Uh, is it only insulation that you want? No, you actually want to then think about the window performance. You want to think about the air tightness performance. You want to think about how the house is going to respond in summer and in winter and in the middle seasons. And you want to have a kind of, a, a, you know, a, an, that's what you call optimization. Where do you put these things together so you get the best result overall? Now, can you, 
avoid having artificial heating and cooling systems. I would say that's pretty difficult. You need, you know, if you did a fully solar passive design and you have the, the, the land area to do it so that you didn't have obstructions and you built a really massive wall and insulated it and you charged it during the winter, you know, that kind of thing can be done. But in modern, you know, you've got a, uh, uh, a semi is seven meter wide plot, 50 meters deep. What can you do in that? You know, that's a different kind of, much more practical sort of a thing um, to do, I'd say, yeah. Mm, fantastic. Um, I'd like to maybe open up for Dave um, and then we'll kind of end up on that. Um, I know Dave is kind of teaching a studio in which they're using kind of a very similar methods, but on a, a, on a similar scale to what you've been doing. So Dave, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, PC. This is fantastic. Um, exactly the, what we were hoping for. Um, I'm really curious, obviously this is a very high investment model to make in the first place. And as you said, you're um, very much testing a design that exists and answering very specific questions. Do I need air conditioning? Do I need heating, et cetera? What kind of level of insulation within an existing um, wall? I'm really interested in what, I mean, and you've already said that the simulation, it, the software is really going rapidly, that there's things you can do today that you couldn't do even five years ago. I'm really curious about how, um, what is the cutting edge in terms of building feedback loops of optimization of things where, in your, in, to take the example we've spoken to, where it would decide to make the window a little bit smaller or a little bit bigger, or it, that these kind of things would be, um, yeah, what, what is the state of art in terms of optimization and what's your feeling around that? Is it still better to do a very managed, because you know what you're doing, and do five simulations with very clear objectives and make your comparisons? Or are, are there people successfully doing full feedback loop automated optimizations? A bit of both actually. Um, like I'm much more of a rifle guy because I must say that because I got uh, domain knowledge, I, I can take five shots and get to where I want to, right? But, you know, Energy Plus, for example, has got a genetic optimization algorithm built in. You can pull a couple of par uh, parameters and go, right, as you said, exactly. You know, move your windows from 10% to 80% and work out one or two variables and it'll do the runs for you. In fact, I think if you go to the Design Builder website, they've got a, a whole webinar on optimization and you're looking for that Pareto front where you've got a few variables and you're, you're, you're looking at that. I think for the building fabric, that's actually quite doable. There's enough within the enough knowledge within, you know, and the, um, the variables that you're testing are amenable to that, right? When you start looking at systems, HVAC systems in particular, that is a much more difficult thing to do to get a real useful result. I mean, I've seen lots of simulations where they, you know, but the problem is, you know, you're dealing with chillers, boilers, fans, controls, you know, uh, humidity of air, you know, latent loads, sensible loads. Each system works differently, responds differently. You change one bit on it, things move differently. There are limitations to how you drive chillers and boilers and fans and the systems don't always do that by default. You as an engineer have got to take that decision, right? But on the fabric side, I think, you know, you can, those decisions are simpler to take. You can take two or three variables and get it to crunch through, right? Um, can you automate geometry? Mm, yes and no, I think. If anybody recalls uh, using Ecotech many years ago, Andrew Marsh was a monster in terms of simulation. <laughs> you know, he could, um, I think he's probably written one of the few uh, engines which could actually design an overhang for you if you said, okay, I only want the sunlight to come in during this time to this time in a year. 
that's uh, you know that's heavy duty stuff right um most models can't do that you've got to think of the of what it is you want to test and then devise the optimization routine and then get it to do what you want you can certainly do that you know you're beginning to see um for example within energy plus you can attach modelica bits to it and modelica is a maths very flexible mathematical language so you can do stuff with it within rhino you've got grasshopper scripting you know uh, it's got energy plus built in in the background somewhere i think climate studio is coming up with um climate studio daylighting is really quite good but the thermal is still uh it may get better across the years uh but right now the i would say that uh, sorry uh yeah so i think definitely options available uh but it is a little bit little bit of a case about learning to walk before you run so i mean you can uh, i would be suggesting get a maybe get a simple shoebox model get a simple uh, optimization algorithm going see what's where you can push it to and then go off and start doing things that are more complex and crazy that's a fantastic piece of advice to be honest sorry um that's a fantastic piece of advice to be honest kind of working at a much a bit of a abstract thinking higher level thinking trying to figure it out how it works before really being able to look into the much higher level detail which as you mentioned is tremendously challenging you have so many moving parts so many variables so many specifics that would be quite challenging to simulate um right i'm i'm quite um uh uh careful of the time not that i want this to end but we did promise people and you that we would end at six o'clock <laughs> and so i want you to go back to your nightly life in your beautiful garden um and enjoy your thermal cooling um, <laughs> um we really appreciate your time pc so for those of you who are in attendance um uh, pc has kindly uh, uh allowed us to record the lecture and post it once we have uh, it online and we have the link um we'll share it with you um i'll get the the attendees list and we'll just email all attendees who have attended who have attended today and we'll also post it on linkedin and and the university's uh, school's uh, instagram account um but until then uh, if you can all join me to thank pc and um uh, dave for setting this up we really appreciate it and um yeah we'll see you all in the following lectures well thank you so much for the thank opportunity thank you so much right? pc no worries thanks so much all right well have a safe um uh Rest Lockdown of evening. August. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Everyone stay indoors if you're in Sydney, and um, we'll see you all very soon. Goodbye.